Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. It was two years after our marriage that we had purchased an older home on two and a half acres in the northeast part of Ohio. I'm not going to tell you the exact location because we sold the home after what I'm about to say to you happened. The house was a two-story home built in the 1930s, which had a large dilapidated outbuilding in the back of the property. My wife, being the artist in the family, had already, upon first seeing it, decided that she was going to paint it or draw it or both, thinking it had great appeal. To me, it looked like a haunted house, and I could care less. One day when I came home, my wife had walked out to the barn during the day, wanting to swing one of the broken doors into a better position for her drawing. She told me that when she approached the barn, that it reeked of feces or something really, really bad, and she didn't go inside to see what it was. I told her that I would go take a look, which I did on the following weekend. We had never seen the barn up close prior to this time period. It was only when my wife had decided to draw it that we had ventured out to where it was in the lot. Some of the board in the back wall were missing and broken, as well as part of the roof being rotted, which allowed a fair amount of light into the structure. As I entered the barn, it did in fact stink of manure, and yet I could see no piles of feces or anything laying dead about the main floor. There was, however, a timber staircase leading up to an overhang or loft, if you will, that actually looked fairly sturdy, so I made my way up. Now, looking at this loft, which was about 20 feet by 40 feet, it was heaped with sticks and branches and grass in a shape of what I can only describe as being a nest on an enormous scale. And there were actually several, if not more, piles of feces in various states of decay scattered around here and there and it absolutely reeked. The indented area, if you can imagine a bird's nest, only giant-sized, was about 10 feet or more across and well compressed, looking like something was living there to my eyes. There were also some old bones lying here and there, but from what, I didn't know. So I climbed down. Having told my wife what I had found, all that she said to me was, that's weird. Well, as the weeks and months went by, my wife had drawn this barn from many different perspectives and to me seemed to be a little obsessed with the darn thing, to the point where she now had about eight drawings of the barn. On what was yet another day after returning home from work, my wife said to me, I saw something peeking out from behind the barn door today. And I said to her, what do you mean you saw something peeking out from behind the door? She said there was a large, dark figure leaning out from behind the door, and when I fixed my eyes on it, the thing ducked back inside. I said to her, what did it look like? To which she said that whatever it was had to have been as tall as the door, which was about eight feet, and it was hairy. Well, I thought she had lost her rocker for sure, and that very day, about half an hour before sunset, I went out to take a look with a pitchfork in hand. As I approached the door, I was intentionally making some noise in case anything was in there. And when I stuck my head inside, I heard a growl that was deep and foreboding coming from the loft. And when I looked up, staring down at me were two large red glowing eyes set maybe a foot apart. It gives me chills to this very day just talking about it. Well, I never ran so fast in my life to get away from that place, and having reached the house, I told my wife there was a bear out there, but believe me, this was no bear. It was a monster of epic proportions. 
I told Marianne that it would be best to stay away from the building and that it would be best to take it down to keep the bears from staying there. The following week, I had a dozer operator knock the entire building down, burying the debris out in the field, and that was the end of it. Today, I firmly believe that what I saw was a Bigfoot, based on what I have since heard of and about them. But back then, if you had asked me, I would have said it was the devil himself. That's how evil and frightening this encounter was. These eyes were glowing like red flashlights, and the growl which it made pierced my very soul like a sword. It was absolutely terrifying, and I didn't tell my wife the truth until many years had passed. We sold the house several months later. On to the next one. My family and I had recently moved to Merlin, Oregon, and we have an interest in exploring. Coming from the Sacramento area in California, we really never had seen any actual gold mining areas, so our first quest was to find the ghost town of Brown Town. We thought there would be some signs of it, but the people at the Holland store said that it was all gone. They went on to explain that in the 1970s, some hippies from Height Ashbury in San Francisco had moved into the area and started a few communes and that they had torn down and taken every scrap of material they could to build their houses, mainly shacks from what locals say. Boy, they were sure correct. Every sign of civilization was gone. We did wander around in the place we knew it had been, but there wasn't even a foundation or anything there. We spent a couple of hours along the Althouse Creek and had a picnic lunch in the flat meadow where we felt the town had sat. So then we walked across the road and started climbing the steep hill. Just before leaving the Holland store, we had also asked about a cemetery that was supposed to be on the other side of the road from Browntown that the gold miners had used, but they said they had never heard of one, so we got the hint that we weren't welcome to snoop around. Historic records indicate that the cemetery had been placed on the hill. As a place where it was not practical to search for gold, we knew that the only Caucasian graves would be there, as the Chinese always exhumed their dead and sent the remains home to China so their people could achieve divine rest. This large, steep hill was covered with the thickest brush we had ever seen. The blackberry bushes grabbed our clothing and made it difficult to get away. We tried to weave through it, while all the time looking for any sign of the graves. Our kids are all preteens, and they kept wandering off even though we had been warned about poison oak in the area. At a point where we found a fairly open spot amid the trees, we felt that it would be a good place where pioneer miners may have chosen to place a graveyard, but we hadn't found any markings to indicate a memorial of any kind. Our son came running up then and said, Daddy, the scary man is watching us. He pointed toward the trees further up the hill, but I didn't see anybody. Just then, our little girl screamed something about a big monkey and came running and jumped into my arms. Looking around, I saw a large, dark shape that could have been a gorilla, but it ran when I spotted it, and the nearest thing I could compare it to was my first impression, a thin-bodied gorilla or a large orangutan. It disappeared among a group of trees, and I heard it crashing through the brush below. We all had enough of a look at it that, comparing notes, we agreed it was about eight feet tall, stooped over, really hairy, and with a face like an ape, but with hardly any long hair on the face itself. We walked the area where we had seen it, and there was a large patch of ripe blackberries where it must have been eating. We found some loose hair that was clinging to a couple of bushes where it had run through on its retreat. The hairs were fairly long and straight. On our way out back to Merlin, we stopped back at Holland's store, and I was kind of reluctant to even mention what had happened, but we were pretty shook up by it. When I mentioned it, 
The man just nodded his head and said, Yup, he usually comes down for the berries, but we think he lives up on old grass flat town site and that area is closed off to people. We just returned home then, but in researching, we find that Grass Flat was another gold camp above Brown Town. But I don't know if it's really a good idea to go looking for strange beasts in these mountainous areas. On to the next one. In Tillamook County in Oregon, Mr. John Parson, a hunter, found large handprints while out hunting. At night, he saw a seven to eight foot tall Bigfoot with a pointed head and no neck standing in the moonlight near a camper. On to the next one. Near Saddle Mountain State Park in Oregon, a bow hunter was in heavy timber when he saw, standing in a patch of Oregon grape, three black objects. They were about five and a half feet tall, black, heavily built, and just standing about. He banged on a stump, and they ran off. This was a cut-over area of heavy timber, and the objects were about 80 yards away. On to the next one. In February, in Coos County in Oregon. My name is John R. This incident occurred near Arago, about five to seven miles from Lampa Mountain. I had a paper route then, and I was delivering newspapers from my truck to the residents of that area. It has been so long ago, I don't remember the road name, but it was about 3.30 and it was raining slightly when I came around a sharp corner in the road and saw the back of a large animal quickly crossing the roadway and climbing the side of the road cut. The road cut was covered with grass about two feet high and was about ten feet high and probably at a seventy degree angle. As large bears are common in this area, Due to the sheep population, I initially assumed it was a reddish-brown colored bear I was driving by. The animal must have been at least six feet long and had very long hair along its spine. I remember very clearly the part in the hair along the spine due to the wet weather. I passed within 15 feet of the animal as it climbed very quickly to the top of the road cut and out of sight. What always struck me as odd is that the animal spine did not flex like that of a bear when it was moving, and that its rear legs were not directly under it, more out to its sides as it climbed out of sight. It also had very large, broad shoulders. The animal climbed hand over hand to the top of the road cut in about three seconds. I drove to the same area a few days later during the daytime. There were still signs that a very large animal had recently climbed the road cut. The rain had removed any footprints, but the soil was still overturned. It was dark with slight rain and cold and windy. The Coquille River was about 150 yards away downhill. The area is pasture and farmland. On to the next one. Bill Leon Bowl saw a dark Bigfoot behind a barn at dusk in Rainer in Columbia County in Oregon. I grew up in the area near Riverton and frequently hunted and camped in the hills between Lampa Mountain and Fat Elk Creek. On another occasion, my friend Frank Ass and I came across claw marks in a tree that were higher than Frank could reach. He is six foot four. The marks were very noticeable, about six inches in length, and were halfway around the tree. 
As I recall, there was a record black bear killed on Lampa Mountain. Frank and I assumed we were seeing evidence of such a bear. On to the next one. In Hood River County in Oregon, the event occurred at my grandparents' former orchard residence in the small town of D, Oregon. My mom was born and raised in D, later moving to California as an adult. My grandparents have been gone for over 10 years now, and the orchard is now in possession of another owner not known to us. There is still someone living in this location, although the actual home has been replaced by a new structure. The orchard still looks about the same. The property is about an acre in area. We were up late at night in a second-story bedroom of my grandparents' home at about 2 a.m. one summer. There was a full moon. My brother was practicing taking photographs of the moon. He was taking photos from our south-facing window with no screen that looks out over a beautiful orchard landscape in the Hood River Valley that leads up to the foot of Mount Hood. The window is above a long, straight, east-to-west gravel driveway that leads up to a detached garage. The property is approximately one acre. Everyone else was already asleep in adjacent rooms my brother and I were up late talking while he took pictures. He probably had the window open for about 30 minutes. The bed was to the side of the window. He would get up from bed, move toward the window, prop his elbows on the windowsill, and steady the camera for some photos. Then he would sit back down on the bed and use his flashlight to adjust the settings on the camera and replace spent film. We kept the lights off in the room so he could get good shots of the moon. My brother was at the bed when we suddenly heard a very loud, strange, human-like vocalization that sounded like a slowly rising, slow-pitched moan. As the pitch rose, it seemed to get louder, like whatever was making the sound was approaching closer. Everything else was silent. It really sounded very close to the house, like it was nearing the window, which seemed strange and scary because we were on the second story. The sound seemed very focused in our direction. This eerie moan made us both freeze. After about 10 seconds of being petrified, my brother shot up out of the bed and slammed the vertically open window shut. He later said that he quickly looked toward the source of the sound before shutting the window. The moan seemed to come from the line of orchard trees in the shadows about 20 feet from the house along the south edge of the driveway. But he did not see anything unusual. We nervously muttered to each other, what was that? We listened for more, but the moan had stopped. We were too afraid to open the window again. My brother waited a few minutes and then shined his flashlight from the closed window into the orchard, but we saw and heard nothing the rest of the night. We went into the orchard the next morning, but found nothing unusual in the area of the sound. We told our family about what had happened, but they said that they had been asleep. They brushed off the story because we were just teenagers at the time. We have been trying to explain that night ever since. We thought that it might have been someone playing a weird prank on us, but we were only summer visitors to the area and had never met any of the neighbors. The nearest home being about a half a mile away. We considered that it might have been some strange animal, but it sounded semi-human and unlike any sound we had ever heard. Of course, there has always been a ghost theory. We never thought that it might have been a Bigfoot, until recently, when we found out about Bigfoot sightings online and heard the 1994 
Ohio field recording from Columbiana County. It is the same sound we heard. I got chills the first time I listened to the recording. I still do today. I was immediately transported back to that night in D, Oregon. If we would have known about the possibility of it being a Bigfoot, we would have searched for more evidence, or perhaps we would have been more bold during the encounter. That's easy to say in hindsight, though. This story has been in our family ever since that night. Now we have a good explanation. The only unusual thing was the eerie quality of the moan. Human-like, low-pitched, more male-like, slowly rising in tone, and as if it was coming right up to the window, which seemed weird at the time because we were on the second story. This quality made us panic, and my brother quickly slammed the window shut. There was a full moon in a Hood River Valley orchard of mixed mature apple and pear trees. The orchard is about one mile east of a small, thickly vegetated ravine where the Hood River flows and the forest begins. We have not heard any story specifically in D, but we will ask our extended family members who grew up in the area. We really never made a big telling of our story because it was like a ghost story and adults in the family would think that we were just teenagers at the time making things up. My grandparents are no longer alive. I have one acquaintance who was raised in nearby Dufer who said that she grew up hearing many stories of Bigfoot. She was not specific about any details of those stories. On to the next one. In Greenville County in South Carolina, it was on a Friday after school. I went to my friend's house for the weekend. They moved down from Ohio. We were real good friends. So, on Friday night, we were watching about Bigfoot on TV. You know, about the Patterson film and other known sightings and how it screams. I got goosebumps from watching it. So, on Saturday night at about 8.30 p.m., it was the summer, so we had the doors open and we were watching TV and all of a sudden we heard this high-pitched scream. So, we listened again because we thought we were hearing things. And there it goes again. We walked outside and sat at the picnic table and we heard it again. So we just sat there. We just couldn't believe it. All of us had goosebumps. So his dad went in the house and grabbed a flashlight and his gun, a twenty-two rifle to be on the safe side. He came out and the three of us started walking down the road into the field, about 300 yards from the house. At the same time, we kept hearing this thing screaming, one minute high and the next minute low. I think we were all scared, so we walked near the river and his dad shone the flashlight into the brush and there, staring at us, were these red eyes. We heard tree limbs breaking, so we took off running back to the house because we weren't standing around to see what it really was. We got back to the house and his mom asked, did we see it? And we told her we saw these red, glowing eyes staring at us. We all had goosebumps talking about it. I just couldn't believe it. So we heard the screaming for about three to four hours after we saw the red eyes. The next morning, we were still talking about it. So around 12 noon, we walked back over to see if any track was around. We saw this grapevine. I would say was about five to seven inches around was just snapped in two like it was nothing, and there was bark torn off the trees at least eight to nine feet tall, and the ground was torn up as well. We could make out a footprint, just the back of the heel, about nine or ten inches wide, and about two inches deep. We could not believe it, and still to this day, I still get goosebumps, and the hair rises up on my arms. I do believe Bigfoot is around somewhere. We have not seen it or heard it again. There was a very strong odor, like a goat or something. It's in a field that farmers use for their crops. A wooded area with thick brush with a river nearby. On to the next one. 
at Walnut Farm in the Piedmont area of York County. A 13-year-old teenager was on their way to pick up a newspaper for their father. When he rode past a hollow on the way, he smelled something that was very similar to a yard that had been cut with wild onions in it. The dog, Butler, smelt it first. The witness looked into the hollow and saw a creature that was as tall as a small shed and was very large. The creature was covered in light brown hair that showed up amber like an aura around it when the sun hit it. The eyes were brown. Its teeth were yellowish and it was eating grapes. The dog left at this point and went back toward the house. It looked in its direction and made a curious notion. The witness became scared and left for home as well. The land is mostly swampy. On to the next one. In Oconee County, a brother and a sister driving on the highway saw a Bigfoot. They were going off to visit friends, and the sister was driving. They were very familiar with the area. As they approached a small bridge that crossed a pond they called a swamp, they both noticed it in the middle of the road. At first, he thought that it was a bear. As the sister slowed the car and hit the horn, it stood up and looked in their direction and then took off into the swamp. It was not a bear. He asked his sister to turn around and go back. She locked the doors and turned around. When they got back to where it had been, they found roadkill that it might have been eating. The thing was six to seven feet tall and dark brown. It had a large back and no neck. The boy was 16 and his sister was 18. Locals had told them about a Bigfoot in the woods, but they did not believe them before this. The animal was built like a basketballer with very broad shoulders and muscular and smaller hips compared to the shoulders. The animal moved amazingly fast. On to the next one. In Scape or Swamp near Bishopville in South Carolina, George Holliman Jr. was riding his bicycle in the vicinity of the Scape or Swamp when he stopped near a stream to take a rest and have a cigarette. As he sat there, he would claim that what he at first thought to be a log had suddenly stood up to reveal itself to be a huge reptilian humanoid standing an impressive estimated seven to eight feet in height and with red glowing eyes. The monster stood there merely staring at him until a passing car sent it stalking off into the swamp. On to the next one. In Brownstown, in Florence County, in South Carolina, Joseph Thomas heard a noise outside his house and, upon investigating, saw a tall, green, scaly humanoid or lizard man standing by his ford. The creature had glowing red eyes. Christopher Davis, 17, from the little settlement of Browntown, was driving home alone across Scape or Swamp. It was 2 a.m., and he was forced to pull over and change a flat tire. He had just finished fixing the tire when he saw a strange creature running toward him across an open field. It was manlike, exceptionally tall, and had red glowing eyes. Davis was terrified and attempted to drive off but the humanoid reached the car and thrust its hand through the partially wound down window. Christopher saw the creature from the neck down, and it had three fingers, long black nails, and green, rough skin, and was very strong. The thing then jumped onto the roof of the car, and Christopher saw its fingernails through the front windshield, where they curled around the roof. The creature fell off the car when it reached 35 miles per hour. When he got to his parents' house, he was obviously terrified. He described that he was attacked by a foul-smelling entity that was seven feet tall with skin like a lizard and a disturbing orthodontia problem. Scape or Swamp is in Lee County in South Carolina. On to the next one. Tom and Mary Way who lived on Branlet Road in Bishopville, woke to find their car covered with sand, scratches, and teeth marks. 
Tom and Mary Wayne reported that their car had been rather viciously vandalized. With the sides of the doors gashed and dented, a hood ornament twisted and totaled, and pieces of the engine apparently torn out with frazzled wires protruding from the gaping wounds. Even stranger was that parts of the car even seemed as if they had been gnawed or chewed on, as if by a very large and angry wild animal. All around the car were found massive three-toed tracks, which the authorities would make plaster casts of and state did not appear to be from any known wildlife in the area. On to the next one. In Bishopville, in South Carolina, teenagers Rodney Nolf and Shane Stokes and their dates reported that a seven-foot-tall creature with glowing red eyes dashed in front of their car across US-15, leapt over a six-foot fence, and rambled off into the woods. On to the next one. In the Scape Ore Swamp area near Bishopville in South Carolina, a witness from the Shaw Air Force Base named Kenneth Orr claimed that he had encountered the lizard man out on Highway 15 and had actually managed to shoot it. In this case, there was even physical evidence brought forward in the form of alleged blood and scales from the wounded beast. When authorities sought to charge him for carrying a pistol without a permit, he retracted his statement. It is unknown just what happened to the supposed physical evidence. This was one of the accounts that encouraged the radio station WCOS to offer a reward of $1 million to anyone who could bring in the beast alive or dead, which brought in all manner of monster hunters traipsing about the area with loaded weapons. In Elliott Lee County in South Carolina, a local man told police that he had seen something not human, green and scaly, running across a field by SC Road 527. In Lee County in South Carolina, a woman informed officials that she had seen a humanoid resembling a green, scaly creature standing in front of her door. Near Scape or Swamp in South Carolina, an army colonel driving on McDuck Free Road saw a creature described as a small bipedal dinosaur run across the road in front of his car. On to the next one. Near Bishopville in South Carolina, a woman was fishing at a local pond when she heard loud splattering in the water. She thought a log had rolled over when suddenly a gigantic humanoid jumped out of the water. The terrified witness described it as huge, green, and scaly. It seemed to skim over the water. The witness ran from the area. On to the next one. Near Cross Anchor in Lawrence County in South Carolina, my wife, who was my then-girlfriend, and I were riding around the back roads of Cross Anchor trying to see any deer crossing or standing on the side of the road. This was our typical date. All your redneck country boys will understand. I don't remember the name of the road we were on, but it was between Highway 49 and Highway 72, not far from Ridge Road, back towards Clinton. It was around 1 or 2 in the morning. We were going down this road and way out in front of us, out to the point where the headlights barely reach, we saw something cross the road on two legs. I punched the gas and sped out to try to get down there so maybe we could see what it was. When we got to the area where it crossed, I stopped and rolled the window down and was shining my mag light into the wood. Back about maybe 20 yards in the woods, I noticed this tree that had a big lump on the side of it. Well, I focused my light on that tree for a few seconds, just looking, when all of a sudden this thing stepped out, looked right at us, then turned and walked on into the woods out of sight. At that point, I didn't know what to do. My wife was yelling for me to get out of there, so I hit the gas and drove off. Being dark as it was, it's hard to say just how big it was, but I would guess around seven feet tall. 
It looked to be covered in brownish hair all over. I'm not sure about the face. I couldn't see it that good. The only reason I knew it was looking at us was because its eyes were glowing red from the flashlight. I've hunted that area for years, and I've heard a lot of unusual things, but that was the only time I'd ever seen anything like that. It was around one or two in the morning. It was a clear night. There were no street lights on the road and very few houses. No houses in the area where we saw it. It was seen in an area of set out pines that were fully grown with very little underbrush. Myself, my brother and a friend were hunting one evening, not far from there. It was getting late, around five I guess, when I heard something make this howl or moan-like sound three different times. The last time it did it, it sounded like it was on the creek down behind me. A little later, all of us heard a group of hunters who were running with dogs start yelling and shooting at something. My brother said they were pretty close to him, and he heard one of them yell, What the heck is that? And then heard another say, I don't know, shoot it, shoot it now. Then it sounded like World War III in the woods. Then it got quiet. After we met back up at dark, my brother asked if I heard all the commotion. He said when all the shooting stopped, he heard somebody say, I don't know what the heck that was, but get the dog and let get out of here. On to the next one. In Sussex County in New Jersey, we were at Oktoberfest at Great Gorge. We were out on the back deck, which borders the mountains and golf course. My brother-in-law and sister with me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw an approximate seven and a half to eight foot tall large figure that walked with a long, steady gait with long arms and a thick chest. It walked steadily down the mountainside, glancing at us, and continued to walk. We all looked at each other before running inside. We all saw the exact same thing. There were only three witnesses. We had returned from barbecue and were smoking a cigarette outside. It was approximately 8 p.m. It was a cold, damp evening. It is a mountainous valley. On to the next one. A boy riding a bike on Old Bridge in Middlesex County in New Jersey saw a gorilla-like creature staring at him at the edge of the woods. On to the next one. Campers returned to find their supplies rummaged through after hearing screeches in Leeds Point, New Jersey. On to the next one. Sunday, September 6th, 1818. Exer Watchman. Another wonder. Reports say that in the vicinity of Ellisburg, it was seen on the 30th by a gentleman of unquestionable veracity, an animal resembling the wild man of the woods. It is stated that he came from the woods within a few rods of this gentleman, and he stood and looked at him and then took flight in a direction which gave a perfect view of him for some time. He is described as bending forward when running, hairy and the heel of the foot narrow, spreading at the toes. Hundreds of persons have been in pursuit for several days, but nothing further is heard or seen of him. The frequent and positive manner in which the story comes induces us to believe it. We wish not to impeach the veracity of this highly favored gentleman, yet it is proper that such naturally improbable accounts should be established by the mouth of at least two direct eyewitnesses to entitle them credit. On to the next one. At Rockaway Beach in Queens County, Long Island, New York, during autumn October of 1893, several people, including Red McDowell and George Farrell, saw a large wild man that frightened local people. 
It was a large, wild man with bloodshot eyes and long, flowing, matted hair. Several years later, there would be a sea monster sighted near here. Red McDowell and George Farrell were rowing in a boat in Rockaway Inlet at the time. Another report from Rockaway in 1893 states that Susie Louth was struck on her back by a wild man who leapt from some brush and knocked her to the ground and ran off. Rockaway was quite busy in 1893. Plumber William Teetle was hunting when he was attacked by a wild man that was eating a raw chicken. The creature threw Mr. Tweedle to the ground and ran off. More Rockaway sightings of a hairy humanoid in 1893 were by a house mover named John Corning and his assistant William McVeigh who were working near the beach when a wild man attacked them and ran away. Another sighting was by Ned Tracy, who shouted at a hairy wild man that was eating raw clams near the beach and ran off. Another report was by police chief MacArthur's wife, who was seized from behind and nearly choked by a creature that was chased away by her friend Fred Sawyer. The final report from Rockway in 1893 was by a farmer named William Cook, who was attacked by a wild man that was seven feet tall and with big teeth. Mr. Cook shot at the beast and it fled. On to the next one. There was a report in the Daily Press of the 29th of August, 1895, featuring a report from Delaware County in which a wild man seized a traveler's horse, killing it, and dragged it away. On to the next one. In February of 1909, residents in Suffolk County reported seeing a frightening creature that uttered a blood-curdling shriek. It was nocturnal, and it glared out of the thickets with eyes of flame. Some witnesses reported it as resembling a monkey or a baboon. The same creature was seen in Eastport, Quahog, and West Hampton. It was reported that strong men with guns went into the forest at dead of night to find the thing, be it a bird or devil, panther or baboon. There was a huge range of sightings at this time, On to the next one. During November of 1922, several four-foot-tall baboons were seen for a fortnight that were living in a vacant house. The baboons attacked 13-year-old Willie Erlinger. The baboons were sighted in Babylon in Suffolk County, Long Island, New York. On to the next one. On the 24th of June, 1931, Mr. and Mrs. George Ballast and their four children were in Alberton Square near Minola in Nassau County between Huntington and Babylon on Long Island in New York. The Ballasts encountered a four-foot-tall hairy humanoid that was very fleet-footed and left footprints that were the size and shape of a man's hand, though the thumb was set further back. The creature was not regarded as ape-like, and, as usual, no one had reported an escaped hairy humanoid in the area either from zoos or circuses. Initially, the hairy humanoid, half the size of a heavy-set man, dropped out of a tree and dashed into the bushes. Eventually, there were ten witnesses in all around Louis Valentine's child care nursery. On to the next one. In Nassau County, New York, during June of 1931, there were many independent witnesses of a four-foot-tall hairy humanoid. The creature had a gray coat. These witnesses included Mr. Stockton, a nurseryman, and his family who saw a gorilla thrashing about in the shrubbery. Police only found a few tracks leading to a wooded area near the New Crescent Athletic Club. 
On to the next one. A mysterious beast described as a large monkey was seen in a Amityville in New York. It visited the homes of Mrs. Alfred C. Albernathy of Bennett Place in South Amityville and tore up an old fur coat, ripped several mattresses, and clawed up an old automobile in the garage. On to the next one. Philip Weingard saw a monkey-like creature about the size of a 10-year-old boy as it rose up out of a swamp and grabbed a bird in its hands in Greene County. On to the next one. In Fulton County in New York, my father and I observed very large tracks in the snow. Each track was about 15 to 16 inches in length and about seven to eight inches in width. They were very widely spaced, about 12 to 14 feet, as if made by something running. We followed them for a short distance. However, the snow was patchy and we lost the trail. Our sighting was in Mayfield, New York, behind Knowles Market. New York State Route 30 now passes exactly over the spot. At the time, I was an 11-year-old boy and had never heard of Bigfoot. Years later, when I read about sightings in the Pacific Northwest, I realized what I had seen as a lad. We were rabbit hunting. It was midday. Sunny, cold, and hard woods with low growth. On to the next one. In North Central Pasco County, near Cruz Lake, approximately 10 miles south of Pasco-Hernando County line, west of Highway 41, north of SR-52. We were in an open field when we heard the creature first. It made sort of a howling, growling type noise. We went towards the tree line where the sound came from. It was crouched down slightly and then stood up as we got close. It was about eight feet tall. It then ran off extremely fast towards the swamp. We were all armed, but decided it would not be a good idea to follow it into the swamp. When we reached the spot where it was at, we noticed it had shredded the bark off the tree it was behind. It seemed to be watching us for a while before it gave its position away. It ran off into the swamp when we tried to close in to see exactly what it was. We were curious at first. Then, when we realized what it was, we decided to get the heck away from it. It made a loud, howling, moaning type of sound, started out in pitch low, then went high again, and then low in pitch again. A few years later, we had another incident in the same area. At that time, there were two old abandoned houses out there. One of the houses was in better shape than the other. We were sitting inside this house one night, when we heard something walking outside toward the house, through the high, five to six foot high grass. Something then hit the side of the house as if something was thrown at it. We left very quickly. The next day, we returned to the house and saw the path where something had walked through the grass. Something had then either kicked in the wall under the window or had stepped into the window and put its weight down on the sill of the window and crumbled the drywall. The first sighting was on the edge of the wood line near a swampy marsh area. The ground was slightly moist but firm. On to the next one. Around 15 years ago, I and a friend of mine were horseback riding along the FEC railroad track between FR-207 and King Estate Road. We were heading south toward King Estate Road when we noticed a smell like something was dead. I thought maybe it was a hog or something that died in the woods. We heard branches breaking like something was in the woods, but didn't pay much attention to it. Then the horses started to act up. Horses were blowing and snorting and rearing and I just thought they were being bad and difficult. As we passed that area, 
the horses acted better, and we went on down the side of the track, still heading south. When I heard the sounds of rocks on the side of the tracks, like someone walking up onto them, I told my friend I was with, I don't want the horses on the rocks, and she said, I'm not. Just then, I turned to look around. She was behind me to see what it was. That's when we saw it. It was about 150 yards away from us, where we just passed, but standing in the middle of the railroad track. It was in a sort of crouched position, but not all the way down, like it just saw us and froze and stared at us. What I saw was slim and covered in reddish-brown hair. It had long arms, and I could see the eyes a little. It was at least six and a half feet tall and around 250 pounds, or better, with no neck. It was getting dark out, so we couldn't see any details on the face. All the time that we saw it, we had to fight with the horses to keep them under control. They didn't want any part of whatever it was, and neither did we. So we got at it there, and I never went back riding there again. It wasn't a bear, and it wasn't a man, unless he was covered in hair from head to toe. It was clear with no rain around dusk. The area was pine and palm meadows in a swampy area beside FEC railroad track. On to the next one. A realtor in Ormond Beach took me north on Beach Street. We turned left and entered the village of Pine Run. Before reaching the area of houses, I spotted what looked like a young preteen holding a tall stick vertically. Suddenly, something other than human walked on hands and feet to the middle of the road and then stood erect. My realtor slammed on the brake and cried, What is that? I suggested a bear, but the shape of the head was not that of a bear. We agreed it was not a monkey due to no long tail, and it appeared to be four and a half to five feet tall. It disappeared into the wood. It was early afternoon, before 2 p.m. The sighting was on a solitary, two-lane paved road, on which we were heading west. It is covered by tall trees that form a tunnel-like top. The area is wild and has overgrowth and some swampy areas. On to the next one. My family relocated to Coral Springs from Miami before the Sawgrass Expressway was built. We lived so close to the glade, my family and I used to ride our skateboard to the levee and watch the Everglades burn. At that time, some firebug had set quite a blaze. On some mornings, we'd wake to cars and yards covered in ash. Needless to say, a lot of wildlife began to migrate closer to our neighborhood. Deer, alligators, whatever. One night, we pitched a tent in my friend's backyard, approximately 50 yards from a canal that separated us from an apartment complex, and across from that was the beginning of the Everglades. The fires had been raging for weeks, and people in the area were reporting missing pets, some of which were inside six-foot privacy fences. We used to run between houses to cut through to go home, this night in particular, before we called it quit, we played a bit of hide-and-seek. I remember hiding under a window box behind a bush and got spotted by an unmarked police car. We really thought we were in trouble, but the police were looking for a person that had been peeping in windows. We assured the police we weren't the perps and went back on about our business and went to the tent. Three kids in a tent don't sleep well, so we were having fun, cracking jokes, and noticed a sound coming from across the canal, approximately 100 yards away. Something was slamming the dumpster lid in the complex across the way and making low, deep sounds, grunt. These were tall dumpsters. You'd have to get a boost to lift the lid. We got real quiet, trying to listen to figure out what it could be. At first, we figured a cow got loose and probably was bumping into the dumpster, but it became evident that wasn't so. One of the kids I was with turned on a flashlight and started making shadow puppets with his E.T. stuffed animal. Then the thing from across the canal 
took notice of us for the first time. The grunt were still audible, but with what I would say is a hint of curiosity. We got quiet and real concerned, putting two and two together. Could this be what the police were looking for? The steps grew closer and closer. I remember we tried to figure if it was a quadruped or a biped. When the steps finally stopped, the breathing grew louder, then splash. Whatever it was, was 50 yards from us and coming right in our direction. We sprinted for the house, waking up my friend's family. They were woken by three screaming kids at 2 a.m., exclaiming something is out there. His dad grabbed his shotgun and turned on the floodlight. He went out to look around and found our tent was demolished and covered with water. I swear, I could feel this thing right around the corner in the shadows looking right at us. We did not let his father investigate further until morning and couldn't believe that the tent had been moved from its position. I have no doubt, had we stayed in the tent, this story would have been much different. I'm 35 now and have never forgotten that night. Cows don't swim and alligators don't jump chain-linked fences. There were people talking about the missing pet. It was very late at around 2 a.m. It was close to a swamp in very dry conditions. On to the next one. We had only a vague awareness of the name Sasquatch before we began being visited by one. We had come to rural Idaho from the city and both of us were so excited with having found such a perfect home in such a great location. That we totally forgot to ask why the people were selling it so soon after having built it only a year ago. We later found out they had to move to a drier climate for health reasons. They had their home built on the last lot on this dead end road. And just before it was a wide cut, circular turnaround so cars could barely even see more than a corner of the house as they made the turn. Since we were new to the area, our only traffic was our mail carrier. With a thick, watery marsh between us and the lake and a dense forest of trees sprinkled with huge areas of horribly sharp berry bushes behind us and six miles beyond that to a national forest, we had what we thought was the ultimate in privacy. That was until we moved in. Since no one could see from the turnaround if we were home, we just left the garage unlocked. During the day, we had the large double doors both open, as well as the side doors, and there were boxes standing open all over the place as we had the movers leave everything but our furniture and appliances in the garage. This way, we could really be organized for the first time ever by concentrating on one box at a time. I purchased a book on Sasquatch at the local sporting goods store where we bought some hiking clothes and boots. When the owner had jokingly said, watch out for Sasquatch, Jean had challenged him by telling him to save the tourist talk. Then the man had taken the time to show that he was being sincere. He then asked where our house was, and when we told him, he said that the folks that had built the house were friends of his, and he swore that they often seen the critters, and they hadn't been scared of them. So now, I had been pouring through that Sasquatch book during breaks in our move-in. I finished the book rather quickly, but it had pretty much made a believer of me. I think Jean was coming around also, especially when that sporting goods store owner had seemed so sincere, and the fact that he had known our home sellers personally, and it just didn't sound like he was anything other than sincere. We were making steady progress when we suddenly noticed that something was missing. We had purchased five cases of bottled water, but now there were only four. Then we began looking over the other items in the order we had brought them just the day before, checking the garage, freezer, an entire bag of frozen strawberries was also missing. They were in large bags that had taken up a quarter of the freezer. Then, checking further, we had bought four packs of wieners to use for quick lunches during the move-in, and three of them were also missing. Then I retrieved the shopping receipt we could go through the list, and that's when we discovered that someone had stolen our roll of burlap. We had stood it by the side door, 
as it was going to be used to cover the large strawberry garden I was planning to plant the next week, and it was a roll 20 feet by 3 feet. We couldn't figure out how anyone could possibly have escaped detection because the front gate of the driveway was electric and automatically closed and locked when we came in. The yard was totally fenced, and on the other side was dense forest, and the other side had only a narrow area along the fence that was gravel, and then only a few feet further it became wet marsh all the way out to the lake. The only possible way anyone could have stolen those items would have been through the side door of the garage and into the side door to the backyard. Jean was already on the move, walking through the two-foot-high weed to the back gate, and when I came up, he held out his hand. I could see where he was looking. There was a large print that had pushed the weed down into the damp, sandy clay soil. Jean stood up and placed his size 12 shoe along those human-looking prints, and even with his shoes on, those prints dwarfed his own. Honestly, had we not have met that gentleman in the sporting goods store, I would have thought that someone was playing a trick on the new neighbors. Making eye contact, I could tell Jean and I were on the same wavelength. We had been robbed by a Bigfoot. There could be no other explanation. The next morning, we were up early and had a quick breakfast and outfitted ourselves with hiking boots, newly purchased hiking clothes, and each carrying a small backpack. Then Jean strapped on his 9mm service pistol that he wore for 20 years as a deputy sheriff, and I buckled on my 38 special revolver and making sure they were loaded. I heard that familiar metallic clink that I had heard for 25 years as Jean chambered a cartridge. Until that very moment, I had been excited about actually seeing my first Sasquatch. That click added a bit of apprehension to the trip. Now, the trip took on a serious side. We still were not totally certain of who or what had stolen all these things, and because of the number of things taken, we didn't know if there were more than one thief or if the individual animal had perhaps made several trips. The food items made sense. As we reasoned quietly, the hemp roll did not. At first, the leaf-covered trail did not give a clue as to any animal even having been there until we came to an area where there were pine trees on each side, and then the big tracks were evident. Gene remarked that he was concerned that the animal had not seemed concerned over leaving tracks, as, according to the man at the store, they were highly intelligent. Perhaps the creature had been used to the previous owners, and they had never ventured up this fairly steep trail, as they valued the forest for its privacy and not for venturing into. We knew from the description given to us by the sporting good man that the trails dead-ended about four miles into the hills. The pine needle-covered trail was easy to walk on, and we were probably a mile or so from the house when the forest became more trees and less brushy, as we could now see the lake stretched out through the valley like a wide blue ribbon shimmering in the sun. It reminded us that we hadn't been to the marina yet. In fact, except for a few trips shopping for food and supplies, we hadn't even toured the town, small as it was. Being a bit out of shape, we both commented on the fact that sooner or later, this hill had to stop climbing. Suddenly, my foot slipped on some wet leaves atop a slippery rock, and I heard a yelp escape my lips. Ever wish you could retract a statement you just made because of a negative response from someone else? That's how I felt about my outburst. It had caught me totally by surprise, and from a bad experience of spraining my ankle once and having to limp three miles in screaming pain, I had lost my composure out of a fear of a repeat. Gene took it well, though, because he remarked that now we had no worries about startling the Sasquatch and maybe making it mad, since every animal for three miles probably knew we were coming. Nothing much indicated that I had been heard, but after a few more yards, we noticed there were no more Sasquatch tracks. We were not surprised because we just figured that the creature had been keeping to the grassy side of the trail until we came to a completely clear area all across the trail. High rocks on the right side and dirt all the way to the cliff on the left, and not a trace of a print for 15 yards. 
Not even a kangaroo could cover that distance without tracks. So we turned back to more carefully search for a sign. We soon found that the Sasquatch had actually stopped leaving tracks since before I flipped. We looked carefully on both sides of the trail, but nothing. Carefully examining the trail foot by foot, we finally discovered a very narrow trail in the tall grass that cut off the main trail at a sharp right angle, and about a foot into that trail was a distinct Sasquatch print in the bare clay area. Being careful to walk in the grass alongside the trail, we then noticed another set of tracks walking alongside the one we had been following. The tracks appeared to be about the same size as the other one we had been following, and the two animals had headed directly down this trail that led right toward a large group of monstrous pine trees. There were four pines that had to be over a hundred feet high, and in the smaller area between their trunks, there was a small circular area which the animals may have used as a shelter. As the grass was all flat and covered totally by pine needles, we walked all around this nest of trees. We could see places in the lower trunks just before the huge branches began, where there were lighter areas where the bark had definitely been knocked off indicating to us that the animals were likely up there somewhere. We kept walking around the stand of giants, hoping to see a pair of eyes staring down at us. We wondered if the Sasquatch would perhaps spend the night up in the trees, or if they maybe had a permanent nest in those upper reaches. But there wasn't even a sound or a sign of any movement from up there, so we decided that perhaps if we were further away, we could maybe catch a glimpse from back on the trail. So we returned to the main trail, being careful to avoid stepping where the two Sasquatches had walked, carefully fighting our way around those four magnificent Norway pines. We were exhausted from tromping through the uneven ground. Having just finished reading my Bigfoot book, I retrieved it from my pack and went to the place it referred to Sasquatch talking to the trees. And studying the four behemoths, we could not find any sign of a dark spot that could be one of them lurking, or any movement at all as we circled the stand. We determined that the Sasquatch most likely just dropped down on the side opposite us and walked away into the forest, as there were absolutely no tracks anywhere except for the two sets coming from the trail to where we were now. Sadly disappointed, we sat down on a log that lay nearby and had a light snack. We were preparing to return home in frustration when I had a sudden thought. I pulled out my Sasquatch book again because something about this whole experience sounded vaguely familiar to me. Jean was watching curiously while I thumbed through the book to the place that talks about tricks that Sasquatch used to disguise their trails and confuse pursuers. I read the part aloud about them hiding in trees and how they most often traveled alone, or if hunting, they maintained a distance between each other. I finally hit on what had bothered me and I told Jean I was having a problem with the fact that the Sasquatch had to have known we were tracking it, or were at least coming behind it. Why then would it join with another one, especially if it was its mate, and led it to those trees knowing we would see their tracks? It made no sense. Above all else, it had to know that we knew it was ahead of us, but why involve its mate or another Sasquatch if they stayed together? Then Jean held out his hand and I placed the book on it. Only a couple of minutes had passed when he looked at me with a know-it-all grin and said, got it. He jumped up, handing me the book and headed just off the trail back to where the two Sasquatch had first joined up. As I caught up to Jean, I remembered reading that the Sasquatch, unlike other bipeds, could walk backward in a way unlike any other bipedal animal on earth. Then I saw what Jean was looking at. Our Sasquatch had wanted to get us off his trail, so he purposely left deep, bold tracks as he cut off on this trail to those huge trees, and then he walked backward, putting the same pressure on his steps so as to leave a pair of tracks as if there were two of them. Then, when it had arrived backwards at the main trail uphill, it had stepped off into the deep grass and simply walked up toward the crest of the hill and only the most skillful tracker could have noticed the grasses now already upright again. We had lost a lot of time chasing around those trees 
and moving quickly up the main trail once more. We made good time up to the top of the hill. I could tell that Jean was disgusted that we were tricked by this animal, but we were hustling up the now narrow trail that was down to a single passage through a much more dense growth of bushes with a preponderance of willow brush and those whip-like branches that hurt badly and leave red marks long afterward. We could see a blue sky far ahead, which indicated that we were finally approaching the crest of the hill, when a large rock hit the ground about 20 feet in front of us, and it bounced up, barely missing our heads as we had ducked to our knees. Now we were in real danger, and realized for the first time that our adversary was certainly not an overgrown teddy bear. Jean had reacted instantly and withdrew his 9mm pistol, aiming it at the dirt bank in front of us. So I quickly closed my palms over my ears. Jean knew without telling me that I would automatically cover my ears and move back behind him to avoid being pelted with very hot, empty cartridges as they flew rapidly behind and to his side. I waited until he stopped firing, put his pistol on safety, and replaced the partial magazine with a full one. Jean had fired all of those rounds into a dirt bank where no rocks were visible, and the small circle of holes was impressive, and all he said was, got him. I knew he would never have shot at any creatures, so I hadn't been concerned, but as he began firing, I had seen a shadowy figure dart quickly around a group of taller trees off to our right and at the now clearly visible crest of the hill. In a few more minutes, we were standing at a place where the main trail was plainly visible as it wound down the other side of the hill on what was now a rather barren ridge about 20 feet wide, and there, just about 300 feet ahead of us, was our quarry, a very shaggy, slumped-over figure that could have been an ordinary gorilla from your average zoo, except this one had long, wispy, lighter brown fur blowing in the breeze as the large creature glanced back once more before it disappeared into the dense foliage hanging over the trail. At least we finally got a good look at our thief, but we both had regrets about scaring the poor animal so badly. But we had no choice when it threw the boulder at us. Had we not done so, the animal may have been emboldened, and if it had attacked, Jean would have had no choice but to aim to hit it. He did say that he was shaking so badly that he may not have been able to hit it anyways. When we got back to the place where Jean had been forced to begin shooting, we decided to have a look around the area between the two large boulders that stood about 25 feet apart. There was a huge roll of burlap. The clever Bigfoot had unrolled the netting and stretched it crossway between the trees and bushes to basically cordon off the area between two massive rocks to create an almost totally obscured campsite that the Boy Scout would have been proud of. As we stood looking over the wall of burlap, we could see signs of our missing supplies carefully stashed in crevices between the rocky walls. Gene was sorry then that he had reacted so quickly when the Sasquatch began throwing rocks, and we both hoped that the Sasquatch family, so plainly indicated by the varying sizes of footprints, would soon return. I thought I saw a smaller brown figure peeking up from under a nearby pine tree, but I quickly looked away pretending I didn't see it and we quickly headed for home. We left everything there, figuring the Sasquatch would keep it. This all happened over six months ago, and now we make sure to keep all doors closed and gate blocked. On occasion, we leave food offerings on the other side of our back gate, and so far the bananas, apples, and pears seem to be their favorite. We hope that by now we have made up for scaring our neighbors, and now we hope to soon be able to at least stare at each other at future times. On to the next one. Are Wendigo located in the state of Washington? I'll start by saying that I call the east coast of Washington state home. Just recently, I went on a drive that I often take. A considerable portion of it is spent following the Spokane River. I was initially going to take a buddy with me since there isn't any service for miles until you get far enough out there, but I made the decision that it would be acceptable for me to do it by myself 
because I had driven this route so many times before and I liked how picturesque it was. I drove further than I normally would, approximately 50 miles out, in order to take photographs and do other such things since I had purchased a camera many years ago but had never just utilized it. And though I didn't end up shooting any decent shots, it was still great to go further than I had before, even if I will never do this trip again. It was still amazing to travel further than I had before. It does so along the river, but there are also some rather dense forests in the vicinity where it passes. I am unable to provide information on locations outside of Washington or the Northwest. However, we have what are known as painted rocks, which are ancient Native American murals that have been guarded and kept in place on the rocks on which they were originally painted by installing a fence. Up until that day, I believed we had only the one, but on that trip, I noticed another one, even though the fence was certainly too short and anybody could jump to get to the painting. Nevertheless, I was surprised to find out we had two of them as I was making my way back home. I saw that the sky had begun to cloud over. When I first saw what I believed was a coyote, I was about 30 miles outside of the next town. Given that I was raised in a hunting household, the number of times I've encountered a coyote is beyond my ability to count. On the other hand, I recall being really elated since it had been several years since the last time I had seen one. It was just off to the side of the road, hidden behind the wall that prevents you from driving off the road. But when I drew closer, it reared up on its hind legs and stared at me. There's no way a coyote could have been that beast. I am familiar with the appearance of a coyote. And if I can say with absolute certainty that they do not stand higher than a human while standing on their hind legs. By the time I got close enough to it, it had already disappeared behind the wall, and I was in the midst of a full-blown panic attack. I was still quite a distance away from the town, and there was no service in my area. Due to the fact that I was traveling close to 80 miles per hour in a 35 mile per hour zone, I ended up almost rolling my vehicle while navigating some tight corners. To tell you the truth, all I wanted to do was go back into town, but every once in a while, I would get a glimpse of it in the distance among the woods. All those instances may have been my mind playing tricks on me, since it was dark and I was afraid, and now I'm completely conscious of the fact that it was dark and I was terrified. However, the very first time I saw it, it was right next to the road, and I immediately recognized it. That wasn't my imagination getting the better of me. On the other hand, I am not very knowledgeable about the myths and traditions surrounding the Spokane tribes, or whether or not there are skinwalkers in this region. However, I'm at a loss for words to adequately express it. To be more specific, I believe it was the eyes that gave me the creeps the most. Again, we come from a hunting family, and I remember that when I was a kid, my dad would tell me to keep an eye out the window while we were driving at night, and that if I saw two glowing things, it meant there was an animal nearby. When I was younger, I used to drive that route, and I used to see a lot of raccoons and deer. However, whatever it was, that thing's eyes did not sparkle as it moved. I didn't get a good look at its eyes. Again, getting the heck out of here was a far higher priority for me than staring at the creature to see what kind of eyes it had. But the eyes of a human do not shine. In all candor, I believe that this is the aspect that irritates me the most. So, 
If anybody has any information that they can share with me, or if anyone has any ideas on what else it may have been if it wasn't a skinwalker, please let me know. On to the next one. Skinwalkers or Kushtaka in Alaska. It's possible it was a Kushtaka, but I can say with confidence that it was a skinwalker. I can't say for sure exactly which one it was. My husband and I were visiting his relatives in Alaska, and we stayed with them in an Airbnb in Wasilla that was located right close to a lake. The majority of our time there was spent without incident. However, there were a few occurrences during our stay that we were unable to make sense of this day. My husband decided to whistle in the middle of the night on the very first night, and I have no idea what he was thinking at the time. The remainder of the week, he felt guilty about what he had done and vowed never to repeat it. We were almost immediately confronted with the sound of a baby crying. Please keep in mind that we do not have any children visiting us at this time. We assumed that maybe it was the TV, but there was nothing on, and there was no one else around. The rest of the people in the home were either sleeping or had already left. After that, all of the motion detection lights turned on, and the child stopped crying. I'm not making this up. At this time, we were somewhat alarmed, but continued to live in a state of denial about the situation. Unfortunately, that happened many times throughout the course of the week that we were there. In the end, even all of my in-laws were aware of it. Then, on the day before the very last one, my husband and I were startled awake at two in the morning by the sound of a loud crash on the window just over our beds. Even though it could have been a wild animal, we were still able to understand what was being said. After what just happened, I really doubt that my spouse will ever whistle in the middle of the night again. On to the next one. I was hunting in New Jersey. I heard something walking around and following me through very thick thorn bushes. I thought it was a deer that followed me from time to time, but I got up on a stump and I saw the very large Bigfoot. And when it figured out that I knew it was there, all hell broke loose. It was screaming and thrashing bushes and trees. I was going to shoot it, but I only had rabbit shot for my shotgun so I moved as fast as I could to get back home. This Bigfoot following me the whole way, screaming and growling and throwing logs. It was the longest hour of my life. When I finally got to my house, I was terrified. I have never been back in the woods again, not by myself, and definitely not unarmed. In addition to my initial experience, I was living and working in Harrisonburg, Virginia, a few years ago. I was working armed security at a wealthy family estate in Port Republic, Virginia. We have a very elaborate guardhouse, and I had several encounters with Bigfoot in the spring and summer. I always knew when they were around, and the guard dogs would be going crazy, and I could smell that disgusting smell. I decided to go outside and have a cigarette, and then I heard a tree limb snap. So I decided to grunt loudly, and then it threw a large rock at me. So I started whistling, and it threw another rock at me. This is when I decided to go back inside of the very large and secure guardhouse. On to the next one. Frank Stannard was 12 years old when he shot at a sea serpent with his slingshot. The year was 1881 and young Stannard was out in a canoe with five friends. He brought his slingshot along, 
hoping to take some pot shots at the seagulls at Race Rock. The gulls kept their distance from the canoe and its six noisy passengers, but Stannard didn't mind. He found something in the water that was far worthier of his attention. The sea serpent appeared to be as long as five canoes. Stannard watched as the creature's dark head, a head like that of a horse, but with no ears, came out of the water. The serpent raised its head higher until it looked down on the canoe. Stannard loosed the stone in the sling and heard the thunk as it hit the creature. Suddenly, he realized the enormity of his actions, and he yelled at his friends to paddle for shore. The sea serpent lowered itself into the water, but it did not pursue them. Like Ogopogo, this serpent was known to the native people of the area. The Manhusant people called it he Yatilik, or he who moves by wriggling from side to side. The Comox people, who lived around the Straits of Georgia, called the monster Nums Likwala, or the sea monster. Unlike the earlier renditions of Ogopogo, which required offerings to grant passage across its lake, the Cape Sable Islands Serpent Monster of the Maritimes, there are no reports of aggression from this sea monster, even after being shot at. The story of R. M. Elliot, who in July of 1917 was working on the telegraph lines near Port Renfrew, he spotted the serpent out in the strait, and it appeared to be scrutinizing him. The man ran to his shack, grabbed a rifle, and shot at the creature. He was certain that he hit it, since it jumped, exposing its neck length to 15 or 16 feet, and lashed the water to such an extent that it reminded the witness of a steamer docking. A more friendly group of witnesses spotted the sea serpent in October of 1933. The 1933 sighting gained considerable notoriety due to the witnesses. One was F. W. Kemp, an official of the Provincial Library in Victoria, and the other was Major W. H. Langley, clerk of the British Columbia Legislative Assembly. The prominence of these men moved this monster sighting into the front pages along with the news of the Spanish Civil War and Japan's invasion of China. On August 10th, 1932, I was with my wife and son, on Catham Island in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. My wife called my attention to a mysterious something coming through the canal between Strong Tide Island and Chatham Island. Imagine my astonishment on observing a huge creature with the head out of the water, traveling about four miles per hour against the tide. Even at that speed, a considerable wash was thrown on the rock which gave me the impression that it was more reptile than serpent to make so much displacement. The channel at this point is about 500 yards wide. Swimming to the steep rocks of the island opposite the creature shot its head out of the water onto the rock and moved its head from side to side, appearing to be taking its bearings. Then fold after fold of its body came to the surface. Toward the tail of it appeared, serrated with something moving, flail-like, at the extreme end. The movements were like those of a crocodile. Around the head appeared a sort of mane, which drifted around the body like kelp. The thing's presence seemed to change the whole landscape, which makes it difficult to describe my experiences. It did not seem to belong to the present scheme of things, but rather to long ago, when the world was young. The position it held on the rock was momentarily. My wife and a 16-year-old son ran to a point of land to get a clearer view. I think the sounds they made disturbed the animal. The sea being very calm, it seemed to slip back into deep water. There was a great commotion under the surface, and it disappeared like a flash. The estimated length of the serpent in both sightings was 24 meters, about 79 feet, and the circumference was approximately 
127 centimeters, a little over four feet. The coils of the body were raised high enough out of the water that the witnesses could see light under them. And both men commented on the great speed of the creature. Kemp, for example, had originally mistaken the cryptid for riptides traveling down to the Gulf. The Victoria Times received a letter during the October spate of publicity regarding the monster, suggesting that the creature be dubbed Cadbosaurus, a name referencing to Cadborough Bay, the site of the first sea serpent incident. The name stuck, and the locals began referring to the creature affectionately as Caddy. While Caddy was not aggressive towards humans, it also was not above poaching from human hunters. In December of 1933, Cyril Andrews and Norma Gorgeson were engaged in a successful duck hunt. They were shooting from a small boat and had just brought down a bird when, about 10 feet away, out to the sea, rose two coils. The shocked hunters watched as the coils rose about six feet in the air, and then the heads appeared, like that of a huge horse, but without ears or nostrils. George then watched as the serpent gulped down the bird into its gullet and then paused to look at him. Its mouth wide open, and the witness could plainly see its teeth and tongue, which were like those of a fish. Neither hunter was inclined to try to chase the beast down and recover the bird. The Burton notes that if they had, they would never have been able to catch the beast. In 1993, air taxi pilots clocked a Cadborosaurus traveling in excess of 65 kilometers per hour, a little over 40 miles per hour. Burton goes on to tell us that the debate raged over the Cadborosaurus in both 1934 and then again in 1941, unidentified carcasses washed ashore, one on Henry Island near Prince Rupert and the other on Kitsilano Beach in Vancouver. One of the carcasses was described as having a large horse-like head with flaring nostrils and eye sockets, a tapering snake-like body three and a half meters long, and traces of long coarse hair on its skin. Scientists posited that the bodies belonged to sharks, but G.V. Borman, a first aid officer at the Naden Harbor Whaling Station, declared this notion draft. Borman, who had photos to support his story, told of seeing a sperm whale brought into the harbor and flessened the process of slicing skin and fat from a carcass. The whale's stomach contents yielded a creature no one could identify. And Borman took 38 photos of what might have been a juvenile Cadborosaurus. As Borman said, a creature of reptilian appearance, 10 feet, 6 inches long, with an animal-like vertebrae. The head has the features of a horse and the turned-down nose of a camel. Here is a detailed version of a story that mentions the capture of what could have been a hatchling Cadborosaurus on August of 1968. Captain William Hageland, a retired Canadian whaler, may go down in history as the man who let Caddy get away. He and his family were yachting off the coast of British Columbia near the Gulf Islands when they noted something thrashing in the water. Hageland dropped a dinghy into the water and went to investigate, discovering a small eel-like creature some 16 inches long and an inch in diameter swimming about the surface. Hageland managed to net the creature and brought it aboard for a closer look. The little being had a large head with a hooked jaw, whiskers, and a myriad of tiny teeth, plates of scales running along its back, and a pair of anterior flippers and a large forked tail. It was brown-black on top and covered with a yellow fuzz underneath. The old whaler decided to take the creature to a nearby biological station the following day. But sleepless in the night, the captain came out to check on his charge. 
He could not bear the thought that he might be the cause of this unique creature's death, and so lowered the bucket where it was being held back into the ocean, allowing the little being to escape. According to the Victorian news, sightings of Caddy have been reported as recently as 2009, and the British Columbia Scientific Cryptozoology Club continues its search for the creature. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!